You are listening to The Interactome, a podcast by a group of young researchers who want to connect you to the world of science by sharing their stories and perspectives. Just in case their bosses are listening, they want to remind you that the opinions expressed here are their own. They also want to remind you not to take anything they say as medical or professional advice, as they are not doctors. Not yet, anyway. Stay tuned about that. And, without further ado, welcome to the Interactome. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Interactome. It's Sam. I'm here with Joe and uh, Pickle, which is super exciting. If you guys want to say hello. Hey, everyone. I'm Joe. A pickle. <laughs> In case you haven't picked up on it by now, these are not our real names. Um, I'm Natalie. I'm one of the members of the Interactome. Um, and the other two folks here with me today, we're going to walk through some science stories, do a little um, science history uh, sort of walk through. So I'll, I'll turn it over to my, to my teammates to do a little intro. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Sam. Uh, remarkably, Pickle is also Sam, but uh, I'm Sam. Uh, and uh, yeah, I am a biochemistry PhD student. Um, and what's going to be relevant for this story is I also do a lot of photography um, to the point uh, where, well, you'll see. I'm Jill. I've been in <laughs> I think we're using our real names now. Oh, are we actually? Okay, that's fine. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. Um, I have I've actually been away in medical school um, for the past few months, and now I'm on a break, so have a little more free time to record. But uh, I know it's been a long time. Uh, today, I want to actually talk about music. I was involved with a lot of music growing up, and played a lot of instruments, sang a lot in choirs. So definitely a different side of me than the hard sciences. So I'm excited to share more of that with you today. I'm also so excited after hearing what both of you said. It looks like we all took inspiration from different areas of our life that aren't science focused and kind of tied science into it. So I think that's going to make for a really fun conversation. Um, I didn't do an intro in the beginning. I'm Natalie. I work in public relations. Um, I have a degree in microbiology, an undergraduate degree, but right now I'm in I'm in communications. Um, so great. We can jump right in. Um, anyone anyone want to? Want to kick us off? I'm happy to start too, but I mean, I did I did tease the audience pretty well by explaining nothing. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should maybe I should dig into this a little bit. Um, yeah, I would love that. So, uh, like I alluded to, I uh, have been doing photography actually for a lot of my uh, well, for all of my adult life, um, about as long as I've been doing uh, biochemistry, but like almost completely non professionally. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the most famous photo I've ever taken. Um, I'm not actually sure if this is true anymore, but definitely for a period of time, if you were to Google me, uh, my full name followed by the word photo, this was what was going to come up. And it comes up all over the place. It gets pages and pages of Google results. Um, and uh, to back things up well further than my own lifetime, uh, I'm going to start this discussion by talking about, uh, well, what one podcast referred to as spicy rocks or radioactive materials. Um, and so this weird intersection of a very weird piece of history, uh, roughly a hundred years ago about, uh, radiation and, um, me having a camera at the right place at the right time, uh, led to, again, like this photo that seems to have gotten its way all over the internet. Um, and so when we're talking about radioactive stuff, I, I want to preface this by saying that most modern uses of radioactive materials are very safe. I... I'm surrounded by uh, co-workers who work with things like radioactive phosphorus, or I believe that uh, there's uh, equipment like that I'm around pretty constantly. I don't use it myself that uses a gamma ray source to uh, do uh, spectroscopy. So like to look at um, the way molecules absorb usually light, but this is actually gamma rays. Uh, it's like a really wild technique that um, is super cool. And as far as I uh, can tell, there is pretty much no risk to my colleagues for using this. I preface this to say, uh, really, what I'm talking about is the exact opposite of that. 
So I'm talking about the bad old days when people didn't know anything about radiation and consistently got themselves killed with it. Um, uh, Life this expectancy was, was like 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, a, people not radiation people said organic chemists have like had like a life expectancy they're like lived to like 40 starting out because they were just like constantly doing stupid stuff with organic materials and giving themselves cancer or just acutely poisoning them poisoning themselves um uh and but digressions aside um these particular spicy rock i'm talking about that is actually used for very few things these days um is rad uh radium so radium uh was uh discovered by marie curie in the late 1800s, so I believe it's 1898 that she published a discovery of it. Um, and it, uh, the most common isotope of radium has a half-life of 1,600 years. Um, and typically, when you talk about radioactive materials, um, the longer the half-life, obviously, the longer it lasts, just from the just from life being in there. It's the amount of time it takes half of it to decay into something else. Um, and typically, the, the you know, uh, radioactive materials live by the rules of live fast and die young. So, Something with a shorter half-life puts up more radiation than something with a um, longer half-life in the same amount of time. There are more details to this, but I am not a nuclear physicist by any means. I've never actually worked with radioactive materials myself. Um, uh, but again, this, this story is interesting for other reasons. Um, so radium, after its discovery by Marie Curie, was all the rage pretty much up until the 1930s. They used it for everything. Um, Things that radium should not be used for, should have never been used for, and were a bad idea to use for. Um, everything from, uh, uh, like, making things that literally glow in the dark, which I'll get into in more detail, but also what was referred to as, what is referred to now as radioactive quackery. So putting radium places that doesn't belong because people thought it would make them healthier. Um, we now know that the exact opposite happens, but radium was put into things like toothpaste, water infusers, and in this case, just water itself. So you could walk into a drugstore and buy water that had radium in it. And the brand name that this was marketed under most infamously was something called Radithor. Um, and it fell out of favor after its strongest proponent, a industrialist and golfer named Evan Byers, died in 1932. A later uh, Wall Street Journal headline read, the radium water worked fine until his jaw fell off. So... I've seen that picture. Of... Of the guy's jaw that fell off. Oh, I haven't that. seen that picture, actually. Oh. I, I, I might need to see that picture. If if you could, like, send me a link in the chat, I will look at it. We will, we will have my live reaction on this podcast. I'm um, going to do that right now. And, yeah. So the interesting <laughs> thing about radium is, um, well, and I guess with any poison, the important part about a poison is not necessarily what it does, but also where it goes. So, for example, um, well, radium made this guy's jaw fall off. Because radium is incorporated by your body just like calcium. It has roughly the same charge and shape. And so your body goes, oh, look, more calcium. Let me go put this in your bones. And when you consume, like, I think it was like uh, 200, over 200,000 becquerels worth of radiation worth of radium, what ends up happening is your bones just all get cancer. And then... Uh, and your bones, by the way, are alive. They're very alive. I'm a little bit sad that actual Joe is not on this episode because I think he texted us about this at one point. Uh, just being like, wow, bones are alive, guys. They have like blood vessels and stuff. I always forget this. And yeah, uh, bones are very um, alive. And I forget Joe's exact text. I'm, he's, a, he's going to med school. I'm pretty sure he knows that bones are alive. But like there was a specific thing he was focused on. Um and being alive means that your body can make more of them improperly and in doing so make them fall apart. So poor Eben, who was sold on this radioactive water, uh, pretty much drank this stuff until it made his bones just completely disintegrate through cancer. Um, and uh, I had read this story um, uh, in high school. In uh, I haven't read it in a while, but one of my favorite... Um, uh, books, which is The Poisoner's Handbook by a woman named Deborah Blum, and it is one of the best popular science books I have ever read, um, in terms of just, like, explaining biochemistry in a palatable way. Um, it's also, it's about a medical examiner's office in the 1920s, so if you're not good with stories where everyone dies at the end, uh, probably not something for you. But, um, uh, so I'd heard about this Radithor stuff, thought it was wild that this guy's jaw fell off, and then 
A few years later, I found myself at the Museum of Nuclear Science and History in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is the only Smithsonian museum that allows for photography. I asked the people at the front because I was dragging my camera around with me like usual. Um, it's a really interesting museum. It's one of the few museums I've ever been to that has scientific demonstrations and uh, multiple uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. But um, wild place. But when I was walking through this, surrounded by the the, the castoffs from you know, at this point, you know, 70 odd years of nuclear weapons manufacturing in the United States, there was this little tiny two inch tall bottle labeled Radathor. And I, of course, just completely nerded out because I'd heard of this stuff, heard of this wild story. And I snapped several photos of it, uh, you know, got back home and just was kind of going through stuff and editing them and decided that I was going to put this picture up online with what's called a Creative Commons license. Um, so if you're not aware of this and I guess most people aren't. Most pictures, you they are copyrighted by default. So anything that's produced by someone in the United States has a copyright that's like something like their lifetime plus some, at this point, ridiculous number of years. Um, but you can choose to put things online in a way that other people can use them legally. In this case, I chose a Creative Commons license because I was like, I had a nerd moment about this. I bet other people will too. And boy, was I right. Um I did not put it there, but it is now the Wikipedia photo for Radathor, and it is also in, has been used by multiple other podcasts. It's also been picked up by some, like, weird newspaper syndicate. I think it's like a conglomerate that bought a, bunch, bought out a whole bunch of, like, small town newspapers. So, like, there's the uncomfortable thing of, like, you know, multi-car wreck on the county highway, and, like, it's like, why is my name coming up on this article? Like, the next one down is, like, weird, weird things from history, and it's, like, got Radathor in there. Um, and, uh, so I, I felt like maybe it was my time to put my own story on this story because uh, it's gotten around enough. Uh, so that's kind of the whole story of the whole Radathor thing and this wild time in uh, history. Uh, after uh, Eben's untimely demise, the FDA stepped in and cracked down a lot harder on quack medicine. So Radathor was actually one of the last like kind of fake medicines that was manufactured in the United States. Um Needless to say, when some rich dude's jaw falls off, um, people care about it. And so this is why you don't walk into a, you know, a drugstore these days and have stuff that will, hopefully you won't have stuff that will actively kill you um, if you use it in accordance with the directions. Um, uh, a, a coda to this. Um, so down the street from where I go to school, there's actually a, a former Radium Watch style factory. Um, really, a, there was four, there used to be one. Um, so radium, when it interacts with other chemicals, will sometimes glow green. Um, and this green glowing stuff was, was the preeminent way of making glow-in-the-dark watches for a very long time. Um, actually, I believe the U.S. military still uses, uh, radioactive, uh, paints on a lot of their, um, on, like, weapon sites and, uh, watches these days, but they're not using radium, they're using tritium, which is a hydrogen isotope. Um, it's generally much safer. I don't believe the radiation can get out of the uh, glass on the actual watch itself. Um, but this allows for glowing items that don't need to be charged up by light already, uh, like uh, typical like phosphorescent dyes do. Um, this watch dial factory down the street from school actually only made radium watch dials there for about a year and later decorated beer steins. But the fact that they manufactured radium watch dials eventually probably led to the building's demise. It was knocked down shortly after I started going to school where I do um, because the roof started caving in and it was in a residential neighborhood. And like any reasonable person, they did the um, residents in the neighborhood did not want their children being showered with radium when this building inevitably collapsed. So it is now just a foundation on the ground. Um, I can, I actually have pictures of the original building. Also the now empty lot with warning, do not enter arsenic, uh, lead and radium in soils on this wall, which is a wild thing to see on a fence in just a residential neighborhood. Um, but the history of radium and its inappropriate uses, well, to be, to, to our, with the trace of uh, watches to now inappropriate uses, but, um, in the case of Radithor, just insane. Um, you know, that history is still existing. It's still out there. Um, and it's doing more things than just getting me, an insane uh, number of bylines on some <laughs> small town newspapers with nothing better to print. Um, well, I think they just use it on a slow day, but um, yeah. 
That's so, so cool. Yeah, so uh, sorry, Natalie, to, I think if you, you Google me, there might be more newspapers with my name on it. I know. I'm jealous. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, that's <clears throat> awesome. How old were you when you took that picture? Uh, I had just started undergrad. It was my, I was a oh, freshman okay. undergrad, so I was, I think, 19. Um, cool. So it's, wow. it's been kicking around for a while now. It's, it's done the rounds. Um, but if you type in Radithor, which is spelled R-A-D-I-T-H-O-R, uh, the first picture to come up is the one I took. So. I Googled so it the other day. Be, yeah. So I'm like. That's going to be your next viral picture. Uh, I, I got a few. Um, <laughs> I tip, These days I've branched out. And by branched out, I mean gone back to my roots. And there's a lot of, I post a lot of pictures of trains with these licenses. So if you happen to uh, frequent the websites of logistics firms, there's a chance the header was taken by me. Um, huh. With these free licenses. Yeah. Um, but that's not really much of a, well, there's a science story in there too. If you want to talk about um, shipping large quantities of uh, inorganic acids, but that's a whole, <laughs> that's a whole nother story for another day. <laughs> Doesn't sound sketchy at all. <laughs> it's essential. <laughs> we're we're biochemists, and well, a couple of us have. Okay, I'm a biochemist. And you all been in labs. <laughs> Goes from we to a couple of us to I'm a biochemist. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you, I think a biochemist, molecular biologist, computer scientist. I, I think, um, especially like well, so sulfuric acid is used a lot in refining and other things, um, and uh, hydrochloric acid is used to pH like everything. So. We, as a society, use massive amounts of these things. They have to be shipped from point A to point B. And when you need to ship a massive amount of something across land, you put it on a train. So. Yeah, but. we really do. I feel like we never, and we never talk about that. No. And it, <laughs> so. it's very it's hush hush. I mean, it's at the <laughs> intersection of the things that we don't materials. talk about. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> on the, if it's on the intersection of things we don't talk about, things I can point a camera at. Odds are I'm throwing a free use photo of it up somewhere. So, uh, you know, Radithor was the first, uh, or one of the first, but there's all kinds of, I love this stuff. That's so cool. Thank you for sharing. I loved that. Yeah, that's really cool. Really, really cool. But I think like we, we can post that, uh, jaw picture online, but we should definitely have like a, like a warning. Well, I don't know <laughs> the licensing of the jaw picture. It's probably, at this point, it's like a hundred years oh, old. Oh, true. Probably. You can definitely post a picture I took and the oh, yeah. Child factory. Definitely. We have... Before we jump to the next story, I oh. don't know if you've ever heard of the Radium Girls. Yes. Oh, yeah. I have that in my notes and I completely glossed over the more famous one. Yeah. That I mean, was, you, could, um, you could tell the story. I missed it. Lost I don't really it. remember it that well. Um, it was just like sort of what you were talking about where radium was so commonly used in society and it had like this pretty green glow that women used it all the time in like makeup and drinking water in you know supplements like on their clothes like as in wallpaper like all that stuff i think those arsenic in wallpaper. i don't, I don't think i've heard of radium oh wallpaper. really i might be wrong i might be wrong um there's hmm. they use radium in some crazy stuff but the, the the radium girls were used to make those watch dials i was talking about oh i think so, i did get confused yeah 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 so they would use, like, young women had good hand-eye coordination to paint the watch hands. And to get the uh, brushes sharp, they'd lick them. So they were consuming large amounts of radium. Oh and my gosh. As opposed to Evan, who was just bad at making decisions, these poor women were working their jobs and suffered similar fates. That, while uh, uh, Evan Byers is jawless, demise uh led to the formation of the fda the radium uh girls and their subsequent subsequent lawsuits um led to the establishment of occupational limits for chemical exposure so i did not know that yeah so this is actually um my brother actually he was briefly uh he was an intern at a company who actually tests for those occupational limits now but um that that all started with the radium girls who were poisoning themselves paying watch dials with radium it makes you wonder what we're going to look back on, you know, in like 10, 20, 30 years and be like, why did we, why did we do that? Like that was so unsafe or like that was so unregulated. That seems like such a, you know, such a huge. That's how I feel every time I drink bonk a on the Coke, head. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. this shouldn't be allowed, but it is. I mean, we we like, should get Joe hmm. on here. Uh, 
to talk about that at some point because I think it's not what he studied for a bit. Um, I think he was looking at uh, uh, flame retardants, so like chemicals to keep things from catching on fire. He was definitely which, looking um, at epigenetic stuff. Yeah. I don't know what I think he was looking I've... at toxicology and epigenetics, but I think I'll save that story for Joe to talk about some candidates for things that we'll uh, regret doing in the future. Um, mm. That I Joe is an expert. We'll let Joe talk about that <laughs> at some point. So, uh, I mean, Joe, I mean, Sarah, do you... Yeah, since Sarah, we've been talking so much about yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Joe. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I'd like to have just a conversation with you all, um, whoever wants to pop in. Because um, I think, you know, I've... I feel like I've grown up around music, so my framework is it could be different than your framework. So when you think of music, what, what has been your exposure to it? Did any of you play instruments growing up? So I'm never going to live this down now that I'm putting this out into the ether on a podcast. So in sixth grade, I started going to public school for the first time, and you were required to, or you could learn an instrument. You could join band and learn an instrument. And I'm like, I want to make friends. I'm going to join band. And they had a bunch of different, you know, instruments you could play. And I picked the clarinet because Squidward on Spongebob <laughs> played the clarinet. That's beautiful. And that Why do you is, strike me? That you strike is, me as someone who would play the clarinet. Like, I, but, I don't yeah, know. but not the Squidward <laughs> part. Not the that Squidward, is Squidward part. That is the only reason I picked up a clarinet was because I wanted to be like Squidward. You want to be like Squidward? <laughs> Who what can most emulate Squidward? Okay. And he's not uh, even good at okay, clarinet, but, and I was like, this but, has to be me. For, for those, but here's the for thing. Those, uh, here's well, the thing. Well, let, let's back up for a second. There's definitely going to be a, a listener. If we get remotely more popular than we are now, there's going to be someone who hasn't actually seen the uh, cartoon series SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. There's... Oh, I, I, I know people who have not watched much SpongeBob. Uh, so oh my god. Okay. Nana, can you explain Squidward's character just a little bit? Squidward is POV. You're an angry 40 year old man that works as a cashier person at a really run down fast food place. Um, and is And it swears that he is literally the musical god like he's literally like the epitome of greatness like has art all around his house with his face like a true narcissist and he's so bad at the clarinet like <laughs> when he plays the clarinet on the show you're like mm, please stop that like that sounds really bad and it turns out the clarinet's actually very hard to play so i guess i did line up <laughs> pretty well to his character can you uh, now, you know, here's the actual question. Can you explain why that character that you just described pretty well inspired you in sixth grade? <laughs> I watched a lot of SpongeBob and I, I don't know I, when I see, <laughs> that's it, I guess. <laughs> and, and Patrick Starr gets his neck stuck in a trombone, which is also funny. Yeah, you but could that's have not the trombone a consistent the theme effect. throughout the whole show. I think that's a memorable scene. More memorable than all the time Squidward plays the clarinet? I don't know. Someone's sticking their head in the door being like, hey, whoever's the owner of the white sedan, you left your lights on, walks in, sits down. Whoa. Stop. I'm going to scream. That is so <laughs> funny. Okay. We could have a whole episode on Spongebob. <laughs> we could. I, I just I had, think... to, I had to stop. I, I, I know you were expecting may, to roast it just... after the fact, but... No, I had we're to gonna, share that anecdote. We're going to stop there. Yeah, so that's enough for me. <laughs> so while well, I played the saxophone because I liked the example they played on it in third grade when they were trying to entice us to play instruments. So I'm not much better. Okay. But... Well, I think there's something to be said about that, right? I think a lot of people choose an instrument based on how they like the sound or, you know, because a, a lot of people learn instruments when they're young, right? So if I was going to learn an instrument as a 30 year old, maybe I'd pick it based off of the sound, but I'd also look at, you know, would this be something that I want to like learn for hand-eye coordination? Cause some instruments are different. Do I want something that slides? Do I want a woodwind? Do I want a brass instrument? And, you know, as a kid, you're not thinking about that. You're thinking about, Oh, cool. Squidward plays it. You know, like I know Squidward, <laughs> <laughs> and, my actual or thought like process. this sounds or this sounds super cool right and there's something to be said about that um 
but I think music in general, the more I've thought about it, or at least the more that I've been surrounded by it, it's like, wow, okay, you know, music makes me feel great. Do you have the same experiences? I feel like that's a pretty universal thing. Totally. Oh, yeah. Right? And so it's like, okay, well, why does it make us feel so good? And like, was music invented? Was it mm. something that's already there? Do other animals have music? Like, what is music? What is sound, right? Because technically, when sound waves travel through the air, right, they're all traveling at a frequency, which is known as a pitch. So if I'm speaking, I'm also speaking in a frequency, right? So like, you could technically so you're singing. consider, yeah, <laughs> like you could technically consider that singing, right? <laughs> so, which leads us to the argument. Which is a tangent. Are we all tone deaf? Or <laughs> are we? <laughs> so I was just. But anyway. I, I was just listening to another science podcast, a lot like this one, that actually went through a whole thing about being pitch perfect and tone deafness. So just a thing. So. Yeah. No, I think it, it's it's interesting, right? And like what would make someone tone deaf versus pitch perfect? How does that happen, right? And I've done, I've done a a crazy amount of research on this um, just over the years. And I, I thought it was so cool. And then when I got to college, I got to anthropology and I started thinking about music in that lens as well. And so I think the, some theories, right? There's no one theory out there that's like, oh, okay, yes, this is exactly how music was invented or how this came to be because it's, it's music. It's like as fundamental as food, basically, or like sheltered water. Um, because we all enjoy it, right? And so for all of us to enjoy it, or pretty much all of us, it would mean that it's pretty important. So, I don't know. I, what are your what are your theories? Um, well, I mean, I think there's definitely people who study this, so I, I feel, you know, we should eventually follow this up with getting one of them on here, probably. I will, I will. But, um, <laughs> I will follow it up with the research. But, but uh, oh, you have curious the Curious to hear you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I have. Oh, I have okay, a bit great. Of research. That's good. That's so good. I want to hear. I want to hear your thoughts first, and then I, yeah, we'll just have a discussion. Um, well, besides a couple people I've met who say they don't like music, which is that was a while ago. That was in like third grade, actually. Now that I think about it, so they probably don't have that same opinion anymore. But um, <laughs> maybe not third grade, but it's like a long time ago. But um, I uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I've seen I, one of my favorite videos I've seen is like um. Like, uh, jumping spiders will, like, drum out beats to each other and dance. So it it probably predates humans, at least in terms of an appreciation of, like, rhythmic beats. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't know, like, codified music. That's probably, or even just, like, the concept of making music for the sake of making music. I don't, I don't know. I have no real idea of that. I just want to bring up my favorite little dancing spiders. Um, I don't, but I think it's interesting that you bring that up because there is a survival aspect to having rhythm, being able to recognize rhythm and put those seeming beats that could be perceived as isolated beats, but being able to recognize that they can be all strung together. Sarah, when I think of your point, I think of, you know, humans are, we hear this all the time, like they're, in, we're all inherently social creatures don't do well in isolation. We need other people. You know, we are, I was going to say pack animals. That's kind of like a weird way to phrase it, but we're very social. And I think music was, was primarily used and I'm, I could be completely wrong, primarily used to create that sense of community and a group helps kind of establish groups of people. Um, because I think like we've seen just in general society, Humans love putting things into groups. So if you can group things by music, that's not necessarily language, but it is sound, which is something that everybody can, can, most people can relate to. That's, that's what comes to mind for me, but I have no research on that. I, I just, yeah, I mean, no, go ahead, Sam. Oh, you can, you can, I, I was just gonna have a quip. I was gonna say that I can back up the, uh, humans don't like being isolated thing. I was stuck inside alone for like eight days because of COVID recently. And uh, that seemed even crazier than usual then. Or, Listeners, like, like, Sam was not me. well. <laughs> <laughs> he was not well. <laughs> I was, yeah. I, he was I'm editing Wikipedia well now, but... pages for fun. 
I do that normally. <laughs> I've been doing that for years, Natalie. And no, I did not put the wiki, the the Radithor on the Wikipedia page. That was somebody else. But I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not that uh, self promotional. I, I try to follow. I, I try to follow the spirit of the thing and mess with things I have nothing to do with. But uh, anyway, Sarah, sorry, cut yeah, you off. Yeah. <laughs> not, no, wow, we, we really. That, you're good. Yeah, that, Sarah, you had something important to say, didn't you? Well, no, I was just going to say, I think a lot of the research that I found over the years and over, you know, my little jump into research over the past week was it is pretty much a social, or at least all of the big theories, right? There's no one theory that's right, but all of them tend to revolve around this social idea. Music is a social aspect. And apart from, so this is from a National Geographic article um, and a quote that I really liked. So they were talking about um, two theories in this article, one for um, sexual behavior and mating, right? Using music kind of as that you can think of, okay, you know, maybe that could be right. Like songbirds, right? They definitely use music and pitch and song and patterns um, to attract a mate. But then they were also thinking, and this article was focused more on um, like group social behavior um, and I'm trying to find the quote uh, right here. Okay, so <laughs> I found it. Um, so the quote is, what makes that feel good is that you are kind of being tricked, much like when you watch TV, into thinking you're interacting with people, tricked into thinking you're part of a group. Our core motivation is to feel like we belong. Anything that tricks you into feeling that way is going to feel rewarding. You're going to pursue that like a drug. And I thought that was a really interesting quote because... It makes sense, but I kind of liked how we use the word tricked because there is no real reason why we, you know, like, like a particular song other than that other people like it and chemically it alters our brain. So like, this is another aspect of the research I did. When you listen to music, you have in your brain, right? Going all science, you have this reward system. And that's within a part of your brain, right in the center, called your limbic system. And you have basically um, all of these neurotransmitters, so little molecules that are floating around your brain, and they have a big impact on your mood and behavior. So um, the huge, I would say like the big three that I hear about a lot, or, and you've probably heard of two, are dopamine, um, there's uh, serotonin, and oxytocin. And those are the big three that we tend to think about in terms of mood. So when you hear music, you're actually releasing dopamine. You're releasing the serotonin. You're releasing the, that oxytocin. And that you release all three. Only, Sorry to cut you off. I'm I'm curious. Yeah. Well, there. I think. Yeah, I think so. They're all floating around in your brain, right? When you listen to music, hmm. but especially dopamine. Dopamine is the one that plays the most into um, reward seeking. So if music has a tendency to release that, right, then you could argue from an evolutionary biologist perspective that, like, music has its value in being listened to over and over again. So Hmm. why, right? And so, like, if we do take the social hypothesis, then, you know, maybe you could think about humans sitting around a fire, right? Like, way, way, way back our ancestors and bonding over music. Maybe it was performed in a ritual. I think also something to consider is as humans became more of like a larger species, right? Music could have been a way of identifying as a group. It could have been conflict resolution, right? Like if you're part of the same, if you know the same song, right? Let's say you have like three songs that are part of a group. If you know those three songs, you can say, okay, I identify with this group. This is my tribe. And so I really do think it's interesting in that kind of way. But that second part, that whole like vision, that's all speculation. The rest is from the research. (laughs) So if if we want to conjure up a vision that is not speculation, if you want to take this in the pithy pop science thing, you could just call it the middle school dance theory. Ooh. (laughs) Tell us more, Sam. (laughs) You have have all the things. You have mating rituals. You have identifying with a group. And what was the last one? Oh, feeling like you're not alone. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it does seem like a very middle school dance thing. Pitbull yeah, is I mean... blasting through the speakers. <laughs> it's 2009. You've never felt more alive. 
<laughs> you're in your I, Aeropostale graphic tee. It's all there. I, uh, <laughs> POV. In an event that... In an event that I will remain silent on whether or not I contributed to my catching COVID again, I was, uh, uh, my whole department had a retreat recently. And, uh, you know, one, uh, like they, they had one that they had a DJ. And I swear, one of my, uh, one of my friends who I'd known for a long time, it was, it was really funny, but like the second they started playing music that she had in middle school, it was like, she was just on it. And I was like, this is someone who's usually pretty chill. And I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> you start Blair. playing those throwbacks, all bets are off. POV, <laughs> POV, you're at the middle school dance and the cha-cha slide comes yes. off. And you all dance in a group. <laughs> we, 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 have, we have now completely nailed down our age, plus her, like, with, like, error <laughs> on it. Every last yeah. one of us. We've got, we, what did we say before? We got cha-cha slide. We have, I was thinking, the, the one that I always think of is low. Oh. <laughs> like... From the window, <laughs> that one to the no, wall. that's get low. Oh. No, I'm talking about apple bottom jeans. Uh, oh, the fact that even I can better r- r- yeah. rattle out the Netflix three lines off the top of my head. You're welcome. I'm going to You're refrain welcome. from it, but oh man, <laughs> Sam is literally he has his palm to his face right now. He's <laughs> but, fully face palming. But like that's the power of music, right? Like bringing us together. Is. We all had that collective experience. Right, and it brings you together, but it also makes you feel good. That oxytocin is a bonding hormone, right? The serotonin is going to boost your mood, and actually, like singing, listening to music, but also singing itself, um, releases massive endorphins, and that is a natural pain reliever. So, like singing, if you're in pain, good idea, right? Can't hurt. When I um, sing, other people are in pain. I was going to say, <laughs> me singing in pain, I think it won't hurt me more <laughs> to each their own i guess but... I, I guess it's better than no, swearing but... like a sailor which is what i usually do but it does release endorphins and it, i mean to me that's incredible um also one last thing i'll i'll drop as a fun fact um huge cognitive benefits to listening to music to singing to playing instruments so when you play an instrument you're activating a bunch of different parts in your brain. They've seen this on like so many functional MRI studies where they can actually image your brain and see what's lighting up. There are so many different regions that have to coordinate with each other. So it keeps your cognitive um, mind sharp and fresh. And especially as we all age far into the future, right? That'll be important. Not only just playing an instrument, but also um, listening to music. They say listening to different music because you tend to listen to what's familiar. Mm-hmm. And there's also a really strong link with music and memory. Um, and I can I can talk about this for a long time, but I'll I'll send it here. Can I ask strong what instruments between... you played? Oh, sure. Um, I'll get to that in a okay, second. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I cut you off so bad. I thought you were done <laughs> no, with that No, no, you're, you're <laughs> good. I just got excited. You're good. No, I, no, I like it. Um, so there's a really strong link to music and memory. And um, I, I think this is somewhat maybe of a well-known thing i can't tell but um in alzheimer's patients right if you try to speak to them it's going to be more difficult if you play them the song from their youth especially from like their teens and 20s they will sing along they will know the words um I and memories also come back at the same time it's huge wow. um it's it's amazing like music really does have a very deep-rooted connection i think in all of us so super powerful, uh, super interesting. I could research it for hours. Um, so to answer your question then, what instruments did I play growing up? I feel like I was always the kid where I just enjoyed playing. I didn't really enjoy practicing as much. <laughs> Still did practice, but I was more nagged to practice. Yes, it's also Sam. <laughs> um, but I played piano from like kindergarten through I think sixth grade or something. Wow. And then I played flute because I really liked the way it looked. I th- I'm trying to remember my reasons. So piano it was my mom was like, you're going to play piano. I was like, all right, cool. Um, flute was, I started in fourth grade. I think I just liked the way it looked and sounded and it looked cool. I was like, how does, how does this like, how do you hold it to the side and it makes sound? Like I, that was intriguing. So I played flute for a few years through middle school and then in high school I started singing and I think like that's what I really settled on um and that's what I liked the most um 
just made me feel great and I love singing. I love singing in a group. Like choir is also an interesting, you're like, hmm, that's definitely an interesting social experiment. Um, <laughs> but choir was cool. Um, I was one of those acapella people. Um, <laughs> I was, uh, well, you ruined my quip by saying singing in a group because like, well, it's the only instrument you can practice in the shower. So anyway, so yeah, I was one of those acapella people. Um, thought it was cool. But now my attention has started to focus to the electric guitar because I really like the way it sounds and I want to get comfortable with the string instrument. And so someday I will have enough time to really spend hours practicing that. When you're not um, saving so lives far. in medical school. <laughs> I, I can practice like a few minutes a day, but I'd like to practice for longer periods of time. But anyway, music. Oh my gosh. I actually did not know that at all about the Alzheimer's patient. Um, that if you play music from their youth, it, it jogs memory. I had no idea. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's so, so cool. I, I learned it volunteering with Alzheimer's patients. Um, and then, you know, I was talking to my friends and they were like, yeah, I knew that. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, I feel like some older relatives with memory loss, there was something about music. I, distant memory there but like that jogs something for me too like that's maybe you could play something yeah. from the exact moment i would remember <laughs> my grandkids yeah, yeah, I mean, are just going to be playing super bass by Nicki minaj <laughs> on loop <laughs> and then you're gonna the rap will just come back this one is for the boys of the booming system like come on <laughs> yeah exactly <sighs> but it, you know it's <laughs> i know it's like play me Play me the songs of my youth. <laughs> so I need that years on a t-shirt. To play it for Natalie. <laughs> cool. But yeah. So Natalie, what are you going to talk about today? I am going to talk about reading. So little backstory. Hey. Um, I made 2022 my reading era. Um, I am on my 30th book this year. Hopefully going to finish 30 books this year, fingers crossed. Um, the one I'm reading right now or planning to start is a big chalumpa. It's at 800 pages. So we'll see. if I see we'll you see. on Goodreads. Yeah. I, I see you on Goodreads now. <laughs> I'm updating you. my Goodreads a lot. Um, but I guess one thing that I also noticed as I was reading more was that I noticed differences in kind of just my thought process and how I perceive the world too. Um and, you know, when, when you hear of reading, especially when, you know, it's young kids in school, it's always like, well, you know, they need to get their vocab up. They need, you know, it's good for the kids. You know, they've got to read. They have to learn. And I was like, yes, obviously a big vocab is, is great, you know, if you're a writer or, you know, all that kind of stuff. But what are some of the other benefits to reading? And for me particularly, I love reading fiction. Fiction is my favorite genre. I really struggle to read anything nonfiction. Um, I just have a really hard time getting into it, even if it's like structured like a fiction book, but it's nonfiction. I just can't get into it. But I always kind of felt a little, you know, weird about that because I, I go <laughs> in my free time, I will go on YouTube and watch people review books. I go on booktube and <laughs> I'm really, I'm really deep in it, folks. Um, and one of the ladies I watch is she loves nonfiction because she loves to learn from it. And I was like, oh gosh, I guess I'm not learning anything. Like I'm just like reading fiction. No, don't let that fool you. Turns out, and I pulled this from a Healthline article titled Benefits of Reading Books, How It Can Positively Affect Your Life. According to the National Institute of Health, long-term fiction readers tend to have a better developed theory of mind so they tend to have better emotional, their emotional intelligence increases, their ability to navigate their social, emotional um, situations and navigate their own mental state and the mental states around other people is vastly improved. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. I, um, you know, like I said, I like pretty much exclusively read fiction and I can definitely feel and folks feel free to jump in like when I'm reading with a character that I really like like that character sticks with me and the emotional impact that the character just has on other people or just what they experience like I really internalize that um so that was really cool to read I had never really thought that you could 
not teach empathy, but like strengthen empathy through reading. So that was something I found that was very cool. And in 2009, researchers at Stetton Hall University and University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center also found a link between reduced stress in reading. And um, for me, it's it's funny because, and I don't know if you guys do this too, but I'll like make a to-do list. I'm like, these are all the things I want to do this week. I need to do this, 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 I need to clean my whole apartment, I need to do literally all my chores, and I need to read, you know, half a book, and I need to do this, um, or else I'm not productive. And then, you know, I get kind of stressed at, like, the idea of having to do all these things, but once I have a book in front of me, and once I'm kind of sitting down doing quiet reading, like, my stress is greatly reduced, and it also helps with my mood too, um, depending on the time of year or just kind of what's going on. I do have, like, I do get affected by depression. And one thing that I've always told my therapist, I'm like, if I can sit down with a good fiction book and read, like, that really, it's, and it's not a solution for everyone. Like, that doesn't help everyone with depression. Um, but I've found that it directly, like, benefits my life a lot. Um, so that's been something that's been really fun to explore, I think. Um, you folks are both still in school, so I think reading time can be a little, at least when I was in school, it was a lot more challenging to read because of just all the, you know, you're reading all the time, you're reading textbooks, you're doing all this kind of work. Um, so it can certainly be, be draining. My cousin's a lawyer and is even like, I want to read, but like I'm reading all day and I just like can't get behind it. Um, so that was one thing that when I graduated, I was like, okay, I'm going to finally undertake, enter my reading era. Um, and I have, and it's, and it's greatly impacted me. So the article reads, reading fiction allows you to temporarily escape your own world and become swept into an imagined experience of the characters and non nonfiction self-help books can also, um, be beneficial for this. I've never read one cause I don't like nonfiction. Um, but they help with like managing, um, anxiety or depression symptoms. And people with depression often feel isolated or estranged from everyone else and books lessen that feeling. Also because you're putting your own interpretation on what's on the page. Um, So that was really cool. Um, What are some, before I like keep talking about what what I did some digging on, um, What are some books that like really affected you guys? Like that if there was like one book that you think of and you're like that affected me emotionally or I can like definitely see it like changed my perception of the world. It's okay if you don't have one or if nothing comes to mind, but I wanted to put a feeler out there because I've been talking about it a while. I did start this off talking about a book (laughs) briefly. I briefly mentioned it. And the the, the whole reason that picture happened is I read The Poisoner's Handbook, which is a nonfiction book written like a fiction book. That is one of the only nonfiction books I've ever gotten through. Um, I mean, I think I would be a little bit, I would probably, I would judge myself a little bit if I were saying that that was like a thing that like in terms of empathy, like, I mean, because again, it's it's a pretty dark fiction thing, I mean, nonfiction thing, but uh, fiction, hmm, trying to like, that, that's, I've read a lot of fiction. Um, uh, I don't know about like, I really enjoy like old like classic science fiction and stuff. Um, so like the, the uh, like Ray Bradbury, like Philip K. Dick, and mm-hmm. those sorts of things. But um, I, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy messed me up pretty good in a way that I think turned me into the person I am today. Maybe not. It, it did mess me up pretty good. Starting out like middle school, going to a new school with more people, and starting off with a book where uh, Earth gets destroyed for a highway overpass is. Uh, <laughs> a weird way to start uh at a new school um but it was definitely an impactful experience um uh some books that like um an author that i've discovered recently that kind of now scratches it itch um as an adult uh colson whitehead is an author who writes some things that i thought were really interesting um uh i this is this is a recommendation that i I found it interesting because um, you can't you can't see what we look like, but like I'm white and I don't have that experience of not being that. And this is an author who writes about being black in America in a science fiction context, um, which I find sci-fi is a great way for me to wrap my head around things that I have not experienced. Um, uh, so 
uh, those are some books that I enjoyed, I guess, some fiction that I think each one of them had an impact on me. So I think it's what you said is about, you know, reading from authors that are a different race, ethnic group, gender identity from you is super important because that especially, and this is, you know, the, the article that I read didn't specifically say this, but through that you're experiencing kind of what what it's like to be, you know, you always hear, well, put yourself in their shoes. Fiction lets you do that. Um, so I think that also helps build up um, the empathy and just trying to understand where other people are coming from and how their experiences have shaped them. Sarah, yeah. what, what about you? I am uh, peru- uh, perusing, well, perusing <laughs> my Goodreads now um, to see what I read recently. Um, first of all, I also do agree with everything that we both have said. I think it's essential to have other authors' perspectives, you know, from different races, backgrounds, like every aspect of the, of the word. Because um, I think that also plays into creativity, right? And I, mm. I see... Natalie, I can see why the fiction, like long-term fiction readers could have a better theory of mind is because you're, you're approaching it from your framework, but it's also kind of proposing new ways of worlds operating, maybe not necessarily your world, but a world. And you get to see that social pattern or you get to see whatever pattern is playing out with the characters. And you get to kind of picture that in your mind, right? There's like more for your mind to kind of grab onto. Um, I go through phases of reading fiction and nonfiction. Like when I was younger, I read like all fiction pretty much. And then I went through a phase pretty much throughout college. And I think the first year of the pandemic where I was like pretty much exclusively nonfiction. And then I, the last year I was like, wow, I I just, I can't do this right now. I need, I need more fiction. And I don't know why, but um, I guess it's how I am. So maybe I'll flip flop back again. Um, I would say that when I was little, like the one series that stands out to me was the Percy Jackson series. I think that was so good. I don't know if I'd say it was like formative because it, like, I don't know how I'd describe that as formative, but it was a huge part. Like, you know, I would go around on the playground and like, oh no, (laughs) I'm exposing myself and I would like go around on the playground and like be the characters. Oh, (laughs) Jesus. As you should. I, my cousin one time invited me over. My, she was my so older cousin. She was like, you can sleep over and we can have like a cool girls night. Like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to go to Barnes and Noble and I want to buy the newest Percy Jackson book. And I want to sit on your couch and I want to read the whole time. And she was well, like, you don't like, want to do anything we- else. So I was like, nope. <laughs> it was like, who's your demigod parent? You know, like, POV. <laughs> POV, right? Like, are you a daughter of Poseidon? Are you a daughter of Athena? Like, who, who are you? And you would just, like, go take quizzes online and, like, try to figure it out with your friends because, you know, that's who you were. It was just great. <laughs> I feel like, like, elementary school me was too much of a hipster. <laughs> yeah, that's probably good. <laughs> that checks out. I was oh. not a hipster. I was, like, I was, like, animorphs, and then I got really into... Not, not deep animorphs. enough to remember much of it. Like, I was, like, and then I got really into, um... A series that I think I have one of the books on the shelf behind me or in the other room uh, because the library was literally getting rid of it because no one was reading it anymore. But there was a series called The Hungry City Chronicles, which I believe um, uh, the director who did the Lord of the Rings movies, he recently, there was recently a movie adaptation of it that was apparently terrible. I have not watched it because I do not want to ruin my childhood. Oh, the other one that had a terrible movie adaptation that I read a lot of was, um, I read all of them voraciously was Artemis Fowl. Um, that was, those were I think, big. Those were big. It was Artemis Fowl. It was Animorphs and Artemis Fowl and Hungry City Chronicles for me. Um, so That's awesome. We went from people who turned into animals to definitely evil boy genius to um, a story whose one of the main characters is a robot zombie. Uh, so a lot of sci-fi. Um, that's been a consistent theme. Um, <laughs> I've out. picked up on. <laughs> <laughs> sci-fi is cool. I, I also read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but I read it as an adult. I never read it in middle school. So I was like, I think last year I read like the whole series. Hilarious. Hitchhiker's um, Guide? 
Hitchhiker's Guide. Yeah, all six, right? There's six. So I think he he See, wrote the first. Six. He, he he. The first few ones were written by I believe was Owen Colfer or something. No, not Owen Colfer. Um, it, might have, it was, was some, it Douglas Adams. He, oh, yeah, Douglas Adams did not write all of them. He he. Really? Yeah, the last two were written post written posthumously, I think. And fun fact about Douglas. No. Yes, the last one was not Douglas Adams. I no, I really want to say no. it's Owen Colfer. Yeah, I want to say number six. Um, <laughs> this is such a, this is such a tangent, but and the other thing about Douglas Adams is no, there's no way. Wait, hold on, I gotta look. This yeah, up. it was he there's did no not. Way. And the, the funny thing is, the quality I feel like goes up because he, Douglas, Douglas Adams hated writing those books. Supposedly, he loved the first one, and then his uh, then his uh, agent kept making him write more of them. Uh, oh, oh, it's it's the okay. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, no, he wrote. Um, he wrote all of them through Mostly Harmless, right? Mostly Harmless was his last one. And then Owen Colfer wrote And Another Thing, which I didn't read. I read all the way through Mostly Harmless. Um, my favorite, Douglas Adams also wrote something called um, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, uh, which is unhinged. Um, I believe it begins with him investigating the god Thor. Uh uh, which is insane, but yeah, I just, sorry, I, I, I got very into that. <laughs> no, and that's, and don't be sorry, like, books, it, it brings such an emotional reaction out, yeah. I have two more recommendations. This is the nonfiction stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I actually feel like, I've read a bunch of nonfiction, but I feel like as far as nonfiction goes, these are probably the ones that most people who read a bunch of fiction and people who are not normally nonfiction people can get behind. I found that pretty much all of Yuval Noah Harari's books are fantastic. So he wrote Sapiens, which is like history of humankind. And then the one I liked better was A Look into the Future. It was called Homo Deus. Um, would definitely recommend checking that out. It's like nonfiction, but it kind of gives a glimpse into the future, like technology, and where we're going as a society, in a global society. And it's just really cool. Um, and then he has one called 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. So would highly recommend those um, if you want to give it a try. Uh, but yeah, let's let's go back to Natalie's uh, point, because we've talked about books for a while. <laughs> I, I do want I do want to confirm, though, that the last Hitchhiker's Guide book was written by the same guy who wrote Iris Fowl. Oh, okay. interesting. Okay. Yeah, and it's... Um, and another thing is, I think, I don't know, I thought it was actually quite good, remarkably, for someone who, the, not the original author, finished something else. Ah, Picks up a series and writes the final book. That is no small feat. That is extremely difficult. Well, I did think that Douglas Adams was phoning it in by the end of it because he didn't want to be writing them. But I, did, I really should cite that one. But I, Douglas Adams was a sort of dude who would complain about having to write books that make him money. That totally tracks. <laughs> There are people like that, you know, um, but it's interesting, you know, we're all talking about <laughs> books that um, we read like in our childhood growing up. I would bet money that all of those books were in were physical copies. You went to bookstores and you had like you turned the pages. There was no at least when you guys were using them, there were no Kindles. You didn't press buttons. Um, you weren't staring at a screen. You actually had the book in front of you. And there's actually a huge benefit to that. Um, readers that read on that like read actual paper books um, retain the information better than people who are reading on a screen and the theory is because we're always on screens so much that we get like kind of like desensitized to the screen so by having something that's not a screen in front of us um, it, it's more of an attention grabber and there's also um Another study, um, according to the NIH, there was a long-term health and retirement study that followed a cohort of over 3,000 adults over the period of 12 years and found those that, who read books survived about two years longer than those who didn't read or who read magazines or who didn't read or read just magazines or other forms of, of media, like the news. Could, could that be an effect, though, that's so... I'm not a sociologist, but could that also be an effect of people who have the time to do that or in a, or in a social bracket that is more likely to be reading? I believe so, these were all retirement. Yeah, people but not who everyone who's retired 
has the same amount of money or resources or even the same habits from when they were growing up. You're going I'm to sure, get... I'm sure when they pulled the participants, they did all that kind of, all that jazz. I don't have that I, for you. I, I always wonder about, I, I, I've been, maybe I'm poisoned by a particular part of Twitter, but now I look at this and I'm like, well, is this just, is this just sociology with extra steps? <laughs> True. It might be. Like, it's always important to have that critical research eye, though. I feel like I think of that with almost every human study. Yeah. It's like, what is, okay, what's the sociological control here? <laughs> Which is so, so important. Yeah. I unfortunately it's just have so a bullet important. point, so I didn't. No, you're too good. Deep into it. Keep carry on. Um, carry so, on, in but, conclusion, yeah. it's sort of, okay, well, what should I read? Anything. Um, if you're pressed for time, devote a few minutes a day to just reading a blog on a niche topic. Um, I've found that short stories are amazing if you don't have time to sit down and, you know, read an entire chapter, reading like a three page short story, um, will do the same, same thing for your brain. Um, and if you're on a career fast track, reading nonfiction offers, um, if you want to, Sorry, I, I said that super weird. If you're a career-oriented person and you're looking to fast-track your career and get somewhere, nonfiction is great because then you can read from someone who has already been um, through kind of the, like Sarah, for example, if you wanted to read a book by a doctor who had already been through medical school, it's like, okay, you can take their experience, learn from it, and then apply it to your own. So read when you can. Don't feel bad if you can't or if you're too busy. Just let it be fun. So, so speaking of letting it be fun and when you can, Natalie, does fan fiction count? Because I definitely, speaking of middle school embarrassing me and things that readers can find about me online, you know what might also keep you young is trying to find the, is if like 10 internet points, can anyone can find the, the fan fiction I wrote in middle and high school. What did you write fan fiction? I I'm not am going to this is for dedicate viewer, my life this is for the, to this finding is for the this fan fiction. To find it. Oh yeah, no, it's out there though. It's not that hard to find. I'm pretty sure I reuse the username and other stuff. So, I think I think <laughs> I I love internet research. Like it, as if if my perpetual Wikipedia editing hasn't uh, shown up. So if anyone could dig up that fan fiction, I'm not ashamed of it. It's out there. Then tell and us what it was about. Tell us what it was about. Read it. It might make you apparently Stay. live longer, Natalie. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned for next episode where we'll do a deep dive on Sims fan fiction. We'll, we'll bring on a psychiatrist and read the fan fiction <laughs> and have them analyze Sam. Oh, man. Psychoanalysis. My therapist would love to do that, I'm sure. <laughs> At this point. Uh. Well, that wraps up our episode. Any Any final thoughts before we bid our listeners adieu? You can tell I've been reading with how I'm talking. I'm just kidding. I don't read Shakespeare. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I think I will again leave it as an li- exercise for the listener to figure out what particular franchise I credit with, uh, or what particular work of fiction, uh, which there is, I did write fan fiction of, that uh, I credit with expanding my vocabulary to point that I think I got a few extra questions the SAT from it. That's, hmm, uh, I feel like it's probably a, it's probably a sci-fi thing. Oh, I or think detective. Pickle knows what it is. But, uh, Sci-fi detective, the, the vibes. I feel like is it Star Wars? It. Oh, Star Wars is a given, but but that's uh, th- this one. This one's a special one. Uh, um, no, Sam I, referring I, to his fan fiction as this one's a special one. Oh, it's <laughs> it's not okay. It's not that kind of special, Natalie. <laughs> I, and by the way, if if I were to write anything like that, you would not be able to find it. No, no, no. no. I'm good at that. About having things, you know. I don't want to embarrass myself. Well, too bad. given you gave us, didn't you give us a podcast episode like I don't know, maybe five or six episodes back on how to find anything on the internet? Oh, that was a video I, I made. Yeah, it's out there, but it's not about yeah. tracking people. I, I don't like. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't want anyone creeping on anyone besides me, unless there's a good reason for it. <laughs> don't creep on me too hard, please. Don't. I don't want to get doxxed for this. Uh, <laughs> but no, we're... but uh. <laughs> No, I, I, I love that I, I, I pride myself on making internet rabbit holes. You're wondering who digs those things? It's him. It's, it's him. Me. He's waving. I'm you waving. I it, was though. waving, yes. Um, I, I'm maybe not quite sane yet from that uh, eight days of isolation, too. So this has been a great time to record this. Um. 
Well, if you enjoyed, dear listener, um, this sort of structure of an episode, this is obviously something that we haven't done before and we kind of came in trying something new. Yeah, sort of pseudo done something before, but this is the first time that we kind of split off, didn't talk about our topics beforehand, and then came together. Let us know um, what you think, if you liked this or if you didn't like this. Um, Any sort of feedback's helpful, uh, just so we can make the listening experience better for you guys. Um, I would be remiss if I did not plug our social channels. So on Twitter, we are at the Interactome. And I believe, you know, what's so embarrassing is that I come to every episode and I have to look up what our handle is. (laughs) We are at the Interactome. At at the Interactome on on Twitter. Twitter, And And we are Interactome underscore media on Instagram. Yes. We are Interactome media on YouTube and, uh, you obviously know where to find podcasts if you're listening here, but if you happen to be uh, listening to this on YouTube, we are also on Spotify and Apple Music and Audible and Google Podcasts and a lot of other platforms uh, as the Interactome. Uh, and we also have a website at interactomedia.org where you can find pictures of all of us. So uh, you can picture uh, who's saying what when we spout something particularly embarrassing. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, everyone, and we'll catch you next time. 